First John chapter number four. This is a tremendous chapter, the writings of John. In this chapter, we find in verse number eight, the Bible says, For God is love. Amen. And who better to write about the fact that God is love than the one that Jesus referred to as the disciple whom Jesus loved. In this chapter, down in verse 19, we find that we love him because he first loved us. There's a lot to do, deal in this chapter with love. But this chapter also deals with some other topics. And tonight, we'll begin reading verse number 1. It says, Beloved, anytime you see that word, it's talking to saved folks. It's not talking to the world. It's not talking to folks who are strangers to the grace of God. It's talking to born-again believers. It says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, lowercase, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit, capitalize, of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come. And even now already it is in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Let's pray. Father, we sure do bless you. We thank you for the good singing. Thank you, Lord, for your good people to be here tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the kindness that you have shown us for Jesus' sake. And thank you, Lord, for the word of truth that we can look into, the perfect law of liberty, and find sustenance and strength and help for our souls. Now, Father, I pray for the next few minutes you'd put a hedge about us. I plead the blood of the Lamb over this place. And Father, we do ask that, Lord, you would instruct your children in righteousness. I pray that, Lord, you'd open our minds to thy truth. I pray that you'd speak to our hearts. Uh, may we hide the word of God in our heart that we might not sin against thee. Lord, may we leave closer to you and better than when we first arrived tonight. Father, I certainly pray you'd meet every need of every heart. Thank you for those that have sacrificed uh, to come to the house of God tonight. And some are not well in body. Some have worked hard and labored hard this week. Uh, some, Lord, uh, have faced opposition and obstacles. Uh, and God, we're thankful they made themselves uh, available to come to the house of God tonight. I pray you'd bless them for it. I pray that, God, you'd do something wonderful for them, and I pray you'd sit down amongst us tonight. Father, we need you. Lord, we depend upon you. We're longing for you to do something tremendous uh, in our church and in our community. Uh, Father, unless you move, there'll be no movement of God. So, Father, bless as only you can. Lord, help us to set our affections on things that are above, and God, get glory to your glorious name. Use this unworthy vessel. We'll bless you for it. For it's in the wonderful and holy name of the Lord Jesus. We ask it all. Amen. Amen. I want to look at several things from these verses. I want you to notice, first of all, the precaution. We find that John sends a warning to the children of God. Verse number 1, he says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets uh, are gone out into the world. Can I say that there are many that claim they know God? There are many that claim that they're Christian. There are many that uh, 
claim they're going to heaven, uh, but they don't resemble nor believe what the Bible says that a Christian ought to be, uh, what a child of God ought to be, uh, and they've never put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ like the Word of God says. Uh, 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 and John is warning us, uh, telling us not everybody that says they're saved, uh, not everybody that comes to church, uh, not everybody uh, that claims they know Christ really does. Uh, so we find there is a warning. I'm thinking of an individual I knew one time that if somebody told, told him they were a Christian, he believed it. Now, they could be the biggest drunk in town, but if they told him they was a Christian, he believed it. Uh, can I say that you can tell me anything, but your life will back up what you really are? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's a lot of folks that uh, may claim that uh, they're seven feet tall and they're only 5'11". Mm -hmm. It isn't always what comes out of somebody's lips but it's what's in their heart, and you see that in their steps. Mm -hmm. You hang around somebody long enough, you'll figure them out. Mm -hmm. Won't be long, and what's in their heart comes out their mouth. Mm -hmm. uh, so we see a precaution. Notice, if you will, the proving. Uh, you know, I was raised uh, up with this saying, proof's in the pudding. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of folks claims a lot of things. I've heard some people claim to be called to preach and didn't even know uh, the New Testament from the Old Testament. Hmm? Uh, just because somebody says they're called to preach don't mean they are. I, I, I've seen women that claim they was called to preach. Uh, but the Bible makes it clear God don't call women to preach. Women are to be silent in the church and not usurp authority over the man. Hmm? In case you don't want know what that means, that that simply means that a woman is not to teach or lead in any facet of service when there's a man sitting there. Hmm? Now, when they have ladies meeting, obviously a woman can teach, a woman can lead in prayer, a woman can uh, uh, officiate that uh, 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 special event. Uh, but when it comes to the congregation of the saints of God, uh, a woman is not to lead uh, in business uh, or in the service. So well, I know a church that's got a woman song leader. Well, that isn't of God. You're welcome. Didn't cost anything. I uh, didn't mean to offend you. Mm, but if that offended you, you don't believe the Bible. You say, show me chapter and verse. Just go read 1 Corinthians 14. That'll help you. All right? Uh, mm, but there's a lot of folks get all that messed up because they base their theology on emotion or on their right, and they don't base it on the Bible. We find there is proof. Look in verse 2. Hereby know. I want to know some things. I don't want to speculate. I don't want to uh, uh, try and feel my way through the darkness. I want to know some things. Well, John says, here's how you know. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already it is in the world. If it was in the world when John pinned this down, and John was uh, approaching 90 years of age when he pinned this down, if the spirit of Antichrist was in the world then, how much more today? But how do we know? He said, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come to flesh is of God. Every spirit that confesses not Jesus Christ has come to flesh is not of God. You say, well, preacher, that woman preacher says she believes in Jesus. That's not what it's saying. That word confesseth doesn't mean believe. That word confesseth means that you obey or you're in obedience or you're trusting. In other words, every spirit that obeys the Bible proves that they have the Spirit of God. Every one that confesseth not or doesn't obey or does not comply in obedience to the Bible, they don't know the Spirit of God because He'll lead us and guide us into all truth. Hmm? Uh, you see, people make assumptions because they don't study. Hmm? So we see the proving. 
we see the precaution. Notice the promise. Hallelujah. Verse number 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. What? Those that have the spirit of Antichrist. Those that have the spirit of disobedience. You've overcome them by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and this is what he says. Uh, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. What a promise. No matter what you face, the Spirit of God that liveth in you is greater than any opposition you'll face in the Spirit that is in it. What a blessing. Thank God for the promise. Now notice the perception. Verse number 5. They are of the world. Therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. It goes on to say, we are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And we find that there is a spirit of truth and a spirit of error. What's the difference? Those that know God, they know the spirit of truth. Now let me put it into perspective. It says, they're of the world, therefore they speak of the world, the world heareth them. The world says things like this, trust the science. And those of the world say, okay, but those that believe in the Lord say, we're just going to live by faith. They don't understand that. They don't hear that. It's a pandemic. How can you have church? Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We don't understand that. You're non-essential. No, our faith is totally essential on the Lord. Uh, and we, he, he has our, our breath and, and he, our being is consisted by Him. And without Him, we realize uh, we are nothing uh, and we're totally dependent on Him. Well, we don't understand that. How can you be dependent? How can you go to church three times a week? How can you have revival meetings? How can you do all these things? Uh, they're just telling them of themselves or of the world. I just don't understand. You're telling on yourself. Hmm? Can I say Brother Ray sitting right there? His dad, Brother Sherman, a godly man, who's the first deacon I ever had. Brother Sherman will tell you he couldn't read until he got saved. And the Spirit of God taught him how to read. Say, so how's that possible? Because the Spirit of truth moved in him when he got born again. And he taught him truth. Hmm? Now can I say, there might be some words in here he can't read, but can I say there's some of them names in there I can't read. Hmm? Am I telling the truth, Brother Ray? I'm telling the truth. Huh? Oh, he might knew a little word here or there. But he told me out of his own lips. It was the Lord that taught him how to read. Huh? Can I say tonight... The perception is very clear. People perceive based on the spirit that is within them. Hmm? And when people have the spirit of God living in them, they don't understand all the Bible, but they believe it. Hmm? And people that do not have the spirit of God living in them, they're always looking for something else. I always worry about people that's looking for something different. Because if you've got the Spirit of God and you've got the Bible, you've got it all. I always wor worry about people that are looking between the lines of the words for something that's not there. They're always looking for a hidden mystery. Well, there are some mysteries in the Word of God and some things have not been revealed yet. But I want to tell you something. If we just practice what we know, we'd be a whole lot farther down the road where we are. Hmm? Uh, but we see the perception. Now, I, I want to focus on verse number one tonight, and I'm going to be real honest with you. It seems like since revival meeting, what a wonderful revival meeting we had. It seems like since revival meeting, it's been tough in here. It's been tough. There's, it's, it's, it's not that we've had horrible services, but it's just not been the liberty we're accustomed to having. I want to tell you what, before Crossroads got up here Sunday night, I almost just closed her out. 
If Crossroads hadn't been here, I probably would have dismissed, dismissed and went home. There was a bad spirit in here. Hmm? And that's not us. Now, there's some churches you go to, I expect that. But not us. It's just been something going on. I don't know. Well, I know what it is. The devil didn't like us having a good revival meeting. He's just fighting. Because that's what the devil does. That's why I'm thankful for verse number four. Huh? And plus, I've read the back of the book. I know what happens to the devil. But that doesn't always make it easy. Sometimes that woolly booger shows his ugly head and he tries to hurt and harm the work of God. And so I, I, I spent some time praying and asking the Lord, help us. And those that came out for visitation Monday night, I even asked those that came out and said, pray, there's something going on. I don't like it. I don't ever like it when the Lord's not having perfect liberty in our services. Uh, so I'm interested in verse number 1 where it says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. And the Lord gave me this thought. I'm going to preach on it. I'm going to preach on spirits you'll find at church. Spirits you'll find at church. That's amazing. I have a, a, a pretty nice library. Most of you know that. Hundreds and hundreds, even several thousands of volumes of books. I've got so many that sometimes I'll look for a book and I can't find it. Because I don't know where I put it last, or if I lent it out. I got books here, I got books at home, I got books everywhere. I got some books in boxes at home, and, and I just got books everywhere. But it amazes me when I started thinking about this subject, there's a lot of authors and writers that will touch on it, but it's such a hot topic, they don't want to dwell on it. The reason they don't want to dwell on it is because... My dear friends, the devil don't want you to understand spirits you'll find in church. Uh, he don't want you to understand his tactics, even though Paul says we're not ignorant of his devices. He still tries to blind our minds and put, have us put our heads in the sand and not really fret about it. I'll give you a prime example. Yesterday, I went and uh, stopped at Costco to get gas. And uh, I had it on 700 WLW to hear the news, and some guy was on there leading into the news, and he was talking, and, and he was talking about what's going on with, with our government right now, which that's a whole lot to talk about. We're talking about the debt ceiling. For those of you that don't pay much attention to this, you're, you're in the norm here. Uh, every so often, we come to a debt ceiling. Let's just put it this way. If you had a credit card and you're close to the maximum amount you're allowed to charge, the most you're allowed to charge is your debt ceiling. And if you go to charge over that, you can't. Well, our country right now is on the brink, brink of bankruptcy. Matter of fact, we are bankrupt. But ever since George W. Bush, any time we get in trouble, the government just prints more paper, more money, but there's nothing backing it up. Let me, let me just, just kind of put it like this. For every dollar the government takes from us, sorry, Miss Billy, the IRS takes from us, for every dollar they take from us, they're spending a dollar and a quarter. Now, it don't take much to figure out you're spending more than you're taking in you're not in good shape. Well, they've been doing this and raising the debt ceiling and raising the debt ceiling and raising the debt ceiling, and now the Republicans say, we're not going to do it if we don't get this. They always do this. McConnell did it a few years ago. They always say, if you don't give us what we want, we're not going to raise the debt ceiling. They'll all cave in the end because they know they can't keep spending money unless the debt ceiling goes up. So they'll just push it up higher and higher and higher right now. We're so far in debt uh, 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 that uh, you've got to go back to uh, uh, Moses' uh, 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 great-grandchildren that far in advance from that far backward before we ever pay this thing off. In other words, Owen, your great-great-great-great-great-great-grandchildren couldn't pay off this debt. Uh, it's so far out of control. And can I say, 
this guy on the radio, the, the guy, the host, asked him, I said, well, what, what are we going to do about this mess? He said, wouldn't it be better if we just filed bankruptcy and the government has to balance the budget and has to be accountable? He said, no, they'll get it done. He says, here's all you need to worry about. Just go ahead and buy your groceries and buy your gas and spend like you normal do, normally do, and it'll be okay, just ignore it. Well, that's what the devil wants us to do. Just come to church, go through the motions, just do what you always do, and just ignore the odd spirits going on. That's exactly what he wants you to do. Because if he has his way, and, he, and, and there's not liberty in the services, guess what? People don't get saved. People that really come and have a great need need to hear from heaven, they won't. People that need strength won't get strength. People that need help won't get help. Uh, 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 folks, we just end up museum pieces. We show up and look pretty, but there's no life. So let me give you some things that the devil don't really want me to talk about. I really don't care. Because I'm going to talk about it anyway. Let me give you some spirits you'll find at church. Can I say, first of all, you'll find other spirits. What do you mean by that? I'm glad you asked. These are things that people carry in with them that we just categorize as other spirits. And as I give them to you, you'll understand. An other spirit may be a weary spirit. Somebody comes in in the spirit of tiredness. Now the Bible says the spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. And I don't care who you are, how spiritual you are, uh, uh, that you may even have your own set of wings picked out and your halo picked out, uh, but as long as you're in this flesh, uh, there's times you'll come to church and you're tired. You, let's just be honest. I mean, if you work a job and we have revival meetings Sunday through Friday, uh, and it doesn't matter how good God's been, how good the singing's been, how good the preaching's been, by Friday night you're getting a little weary in the flesh. Hmm? It just happens. You may have uh, had a day where you've worked hard today uh, and you face things uh, and you put up with things uh, and you come in and you sit down. It's the first time all day you've got a break. And realize, you know what, I'm tired. That's normal. That's an other spirit. That's normal. The good thing about the Spirit of God, there have been times I've been so wore out and come to the house of God and don't even know how I'm going to keep my eyes open. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God kind of refreshes me. And all of a sudden, things get better. And that's why, you know, people say, well, you know, I've got a headache. Do you know how many times I've come to church with a headache? But it's amazing, before the first congregational song's over, I'm feeling better. Huh? There's been times I've been sick, come to the house of God, all of a sudden get feeling better. There's something about the Spirit of God that can help us no matter what kind of fleshly state we're in. Hmm? Huh? Listen, if I don't feel well, I'm not going to feel well at home. I might as well come out to church. Maybe I'll get some help. Huh? Matter of fact, my back hurt me today. I, I don't know what it is. I mowed the grass. It's been hurting ever since. Well, I'd been hurting if I stayed home. So might as well just come out, move it around and feel a little better, so it's a good thing I'm preaching. But, you know, hey, if we took a poll every time that we have church, everybody's got something. Hmm? The pollen's getting you. You know, your old creak, creepy bones are getting you. Uh, uh, I used to have this guy come to my grandpa's church. He always complained about his bursitis. I don't know what bursitis is, but somebody's got that going on. We got something. Everybody's got something. Uh, that's one of those other spirits. Uh, it's a weary spirit. Can I say some people have an other spirit? They have a wandering spirit. If you're not careful, and if you're honest tonight, you'll admit there's been times you've been sitting in church and your mind starts wandering. If you've got a wandering spirit, that probably means you're normal. Huh? Again, the spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. And sometimes we're, we're focusing on the message, and all of a sudden we catch our mind wandering. So we have to bring that back under submission to focus on the message again. Huh? 
that's an other spirit. It's a weary spirit. It's a wandering spirit. But then there are some folks that have worldly spirits. You say, what are you talking about? Their mind's always on worldly things. Listen, it's a, it's a difficult practice, but it's a practice you can overcome because if you know the Lord, He's made you a king and priest. He's made you king to rule over your flesh. But it ought to be a practice when you walk in those sanctuary doors that you check everything else at the coat room. And you come and you put your mind on heavenly things. But there are some people that come to the house of God that have another spirit. Their spirit's on worldly things. Uh, their spirit's on uh, uh, their sports team, or their spirit's on the news, or their spirit's on the weather. But all you need is a crack of thunder. You can find out usually where people's spirit is. Uh, 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 there's some people, their spirit's on something else that's out there in the world. And it's not on Christ. And can I say, other spirits, if there's enough of them in here, it impacts the service. There are other spirits. Can I say this? There are odd spirits. Now, an odd spirit is a demonic spirit. And make no mistake, the devil or one of his imps is present at every church service. Mm -mm. They never miss a service. They're the most faithful of the faithful. Mm -mm. Because he wants to do everything he can to keep us from being blessed. And he can't do that if he don't show up. And there are some odd spirits, some demonic spirits. Can I say some things about demonic spirits? Uh, first of all, they cause confusion. They don't want you to understand the Bible. They don't want things to be perfectly clear to you. They don't want you getting help. They don't want you getting strength. They want to send confusion to the service. Have you ever seen an integral part of the service, usually the invitation time, and all of a sudden out of nowhere there's a noise? Out of nowhere, somebody pinches a baby and the baby gets upset. You know, babies are going to get upset. Huh? But always at an integral time, there'll be something. I've, been, I've seen during uh, 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 invitation services and the Lord dealing with a sinner to get saved and somebody will uh, get their car keys out. Somebody's cell phone will go off. Uh, uh, somebody gets up and puts their coat on. Somebody goes out to get a drink. Anything that will stop the Spirit of God from dealing with somebody. They're spirits of confusion. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, 33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. Anytime there's something confusing going on, it's not of God. It's an odd spirit. It's a demonic spirit. Matter of fact, that verse they wrote about not being the author of confusion is right after he tells women to be silent in the church. When you go to read that tonight, you'll find that out. Hmm? Uh, can I say that James said this in James 3.16, For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. Can I say confusion is always followed by evil? Hmm? Odd spirits cause confusion. Odd spirits are controlling. They want to control people. The Bible says not to grieve the Spirit of God. The Bible says quench not the Spirit. But there's a spirit of this world, a demonic spirit, that wants to control you, that wants you to grieve and quench the Spirit of God. Now let me say this, if you're saved, if the Spirit of God lives in you, the, you can never be possessed by a demon. But you can be attacked by one. You can have one uh, 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 put thoughts in your mind, and if you yield to them, that Spirit will control you. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 5.15, For some are already turned aside after Satan. Let me just say this, I don't mean this to be sound arrogant or prideful or, or anything other than the statement I'm going to make. If somebody sits under a true Bible preaching church and then all of a sudden decides they're going to go and look for something else, they've been turned aside by an odd spirit or demonic spirit. The Spirit of God will never lead you away from truth right. to falseness. Right. Hmm? So what will lead you out there to look for something else? A false spirit. Hmm? And by the way, they're knocking on doors. Miss Billy had some JWs uh, today. 
coming to your door soon. Mm -mm. I uh, highly recommend opening the door with a 12 gauge. That will solve the problem. Don't pull the trigger, just show it to them. Huh? And say, oh, I was just cleaning my gun. How can I help you? They'll say, you can't see you. Huh? Huh? Or you could do this. Greet them with 66 books. A 66 gauge. Hmm? That's what I always do. They open the door, whether they're the Mormons or the Jehos, we the one. They open the door and say, where from and such and that? I say, I'm going to stop you right there. I'm an independent Baptist preacher. And I'm not interested in your stuff. And if you open your mouth, you're getting what's coming. And then they'll always try something, and then I'll preach to them, and they tuck tail and run. Huh? Because they don't want the Bible. Odd spirits don't want truth. And anything that will lead you away from truth is an odd spirit. They're controlling. They cause confusion. And they're also counterfeit. Let me read you the verse, and I'll give you the story. Matthew 5.21 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. What is the will of, of the Father? It's God's will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's God's will for everyone to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Verse 22 says, Many will say unto me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, preached in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, uh, in thy name done many wonderful works, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. We had a couple visit the church probably 12, 15 years ago. I lose track of time while back and this fella really took an interest because at that time Christian was playing football and I think you all were playing for the championship that's when I had your number you know cut in my hair and the net about died when I had my hair cut and I had 55 put in my hair uh, but uh, she said what are people going to think I said they're going to be looking at my face and who cares what they think huh but this it really spoke to that guy that I cared so much about my boy that I really didn't care what anybody else thought and I had that done and his wife was super sweet, uh, and they came for a while, and they wanted to join the church. And when I met with them, uh, 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 he, he had never been scripturally baptized, so I, I told him we'd have scripturally baptized, and he said that'd be fine. And it was in December, uh, uh, and I'll never forget, we'd scheduled a baptism, and uh, the heater went out. And we didn't find out till like, Saturday when we was filling it up, there's no heat for the water. So I had nine people to baptize, and, and I contacted all of them, but I didn't get him. I left a message on his machine. I told them all the same thing, Miss Marcy. I said, there's no heater. The water's going to be cold. Uh, if, if you will, we'll not have the baptism. We'll get the heater fixed, and we'll reschedule it. But if you want to go ahead and get baptized, if you're up for it, I'll do it. Really didn't want to, but I would. Uh well, that guy showed up Saturday night at men's prayer meeting. For whatever reason, missing that night, I had something to do, and I didn't come to men's prayer meeting that night. I had somebody else lead it. And that guy showed up and was absolutely belligerent. How dare we cancel the baptism? He had family coming in from out of town. Just went nuts. And uh, Brother Larry led the prayer meeting because Brother Larry called me afterwards. And again, Brother Peter, I didn't tell him we wouldn't have it. I told him, let me know. But I'd still baptize him. Probably would have appointed you to do it that night. Huh? Well, I just remember sitting in, in, in our family room. I had all the lights off, and I just asked the Lord, Lord, what is up with this guy? You know? And Seth, the Spirit of God spoke to my heart and said, He's a wolf. I thought, okay, Lord, that's all he said. That's all I need to know. Well, Sunday morning, we come, come to church, and that guy comes in, and Brother Larry and I took him to my office, and he sat down, and he's just belligerent. He's going on and on and on, and I looked at him, and I said, well, the Lord told me you're of the devil. I want to tell you something. If you look at me and tell me I'm of the devil, we're probably going to fight. 
You know what I'm saying? Uh, it ain't going to be pretty anyway, shape or form. Huh? It's going to get ugly. He didn't even bat an eye, Brother Clint. He kind of was. But he had moved here from California. This is what he told me. He said, well, I'm going to go back to California. I said, well, that's a good idea. Uh, he's probably governor out there. That's, I think his name was Newsom. Uh, you say, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say that not everybody that says, Lord, Lord's born again. Uh, and, and say, when, when I talked to him initially, he had the right words to say that he had trusted in Christ, but he hadn't. The Spirit of God told me something different, and when I confronted him on it, he didn't even bat an eye. He knew he was of the devil. He was probably full of the devil. Say, so why was he here? Who do well, you, you think sent him? And the Lord just was looking out for us and didn't let the heater work because had that bird became a member of the church, no telling how much damage he'd have caused. Uh, I'm just saying there's some odd spirits. Hmm? Uh, I'm not super spiritual, trust me. I just love the Lord. I believe the Bible. But every now and then the Lord just kind of says something. Sometimes it just might be a, hmm. Do you ever shake somebody's hand and go, hmm? Something about that dude, something about that gal right there, hmm? Uh, there's been times, Miss Annette said, you better keep an eye on that one. I've learned a long time ago, she's a whole lot closer to God to me. and She's never missed it. So there's been preachers come through and say, that guy's not real. And I always try to give people the benefit of the doubt, only to find out she's always right. That guy wasn't real. Huh? What I'm trying to say is you've got to, you got to be careful. Not everybody comes to church. It's coming for the right reasons. Uh, I remind you, Jesus told the story of how the devil sowed tares among the wheat. Mm. And the only way you can tell the difference between a wheat and a tares at harvest time. And can I say, when the church is raptured out, not everybody sitting on a, uh, on a church pew is going. Hmm? Huh? Not every Baptist is going to heaven, friend. That may bust your bubble. They're not. Hmm? Only those that have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And if that busts your bubble, this might bust your bubble too. Not everybody that goes to, to churches that we would say is not, not a true church is lost. There are folks in other denominations out there that are saved going to heaven, same as you and I. Hmm? Uh, so we find there are odd spirits. There are other spirits. You may have run into this one. There are opinionated spirits. Mm. If you haven't, hang out at my house for a while and take some of the phone calls I take and see some things I say. You'll find out there are opinionated spirits in the church. Can I say something? As the title suggests, they're judgmental. Mm. Again, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 says, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Hmm? Uh, the Bible says you do reap what you sow. You better be careful. The Bible goes on to tell us not to judge another man's servant. Hmm? You can't see in somebody's heart. You don't know the motives of why they do things. You've not walked in their shoes. Uh, and it's not up to you and I to judge them. But it amazes me how many people have opinions. They're judgmental. Well, that person's not right with God. How do you know? And by the way, you making that statement tells me you're not right with God. Hmm? It, it, it's amazing how we can look into the mirror and see perfection. But we can look around and see ultimate chaos. Hmm? Uh, uh, Mark eleven twenty five says, and we or uh, no, that's later. I didn't have my glasses on. A an opinionated spirit is judgmental. Can I say not only that? An opinionated spirit justifies themselves. Hmm? It's like when a preacher preaches on sin, and he preaches on your sin or my sin. We have an innate ability to look around and see who that applies to, but we never see it applies to us. Because we'll make excuse for our sin. Well, the preacher don't know what I've been through. Well, the preacher's just preaching. 
Hmm? Huh? But if the shoe fits, wear it. Huh? It amazes me how people can justify anything. You know what is wonderful about the Bible? The law is blind. It applies to everybody. Hmm? Now, I know in America the law doesn't apply to everybody. But the Bible has a righteous judge coming, and he's going to judge us by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. It don't matter what color you are. It don't matter what side of the tracks you was born on. doesn't matter what level of education you got. doesn't matter how much money you got. doesn't matter. The law applies to everybody. Hmm? Whether we like it or not. Hmm? Hmm? I've still yet to figure out two things. I've asked this question a lot in my 36 years of preaching. Nobody will ever answer me. They'll never come and give me a synopsis. They'll never come and give me the cold facts. The first thing that I'm amazed at, and nobody can ever tell me, when do we get to the place in our Christian life that we don't have to come to Sunday school? We have classes for all ages. When do we arrive and we graduate and don't have to come to Sunday school? Now, Brother Brian, and I know you get up early. You, Miss Veronica, you get up. There's something wrong with y'all. <laughs> there really is. And, and if anybody would have an excuse to take an extra hour on Sunday, get a little extra sleep, it'd be y'all. Huh? But when have you ever went into the boss man and said, you know what, I'm going to come in an hour late because I need the extra sleep. How long do you think you'd have a, have a job? They say, well, tell you what, you get all the sleep you want. Because we don't need you. We need you from whatever time, four in the morning or whatever time you all go in to however long you stay, or you can go on down the road. But we think, well, it's, it's just church. You know, I need my job. I don't need Sunday school. Uh, who do you think gave you your job? And if you can show me in the Bible where we don't, we don't need more teaching and preaching of the Bible, then we'll just cancel Sunday school altogether. Huh? But what's good for the goose is good for the gander. How long do you think I'd be pastor here if I say, you know what, I'll just show up at 11 o'clock? By the way, if I had that attitude, you ought to throw me out. Huh? That's the first thing that really... I, nobody will ever answer that question. Here's the second one. When do we ever get so spiritual we can only come to church on Sunday morning? Go read the Gospels. Every Sabbath day, guess who you found in the synagogue? Jesus. And He's the one we're to pattern our life after. Huh? But when do we get to the point that we can pick and choose when we get to... Now, I'm not talking about you being providentially hindered. I'm not talking about if you have to work. I'm not talking about if you're sick. If you're sick, we don't want it. But a lot of us make up illnesses. Hmm? Uh, it's amazing how that blue flu shows up on Sunday night, but you're cured to go to work on Monday. Uh, friend faithful means faithful. Doesn't mean pretty faithful. And it's been a while since I've used the illustration, but the truth of the matter is, if I tell my wife at the end of the week, I've been pretty faithful this week, that ain't going to fly at the foster household. It's all in, or there's a problem. So we're to be faithful. If we're not faithful, we're subject to odd spirits and other spirits and we'll get an opinionated spirit. But it amazes me how people always got an excuse. Well, I do caution you. 
you are going to appear at the judgment seat of Christ and you're not going to give an account to brother Doug you're going to give an account to the one who's not the babe in the manger or the broken shell on the cross the one whose eyes are as flames of fire his hair is white as wool his voice is as many thunderings his countenance is as brass uh, and you're going to not have an excuse at all when you stand before him because he's going to reveal the truth I don't know about you, but that's sobering to me. Hmm? You know, we sing them songs about mansions over the hilltop and all that. I, I can't really get excited about New Jerusalem because I know before that there's the judgment seat of Christ. And everyone's going to give account of himself to God. Well, not only are opinionated spirits judgmental and justifying, they're also jugular, they're ruthless. They will kill a church. I'm thinking of a pastor's wife I once knew. The preacher did everything he could to build up a church, was a great man, preached the word of God, and all the while his wife went behind him and tore down everything he was trying to build. How did she do it? She'd talk about this one. Then she'd go over here and talk to this one about this one. She'd go to this one, talk to this one about this one, just kept, kept it up, kept it up, kept it up. Till finally they approached the preacher when they started putting two and two together, one where all the talk came from. And they approached the preacher and said, your wife's out of control. And he got up in the pulpit and said, I don't care what any of you think. My wife's right with God. If you don't like it, you can leave. That day 270 walked out. Church has never recovered. Hmm. Opinionated people can be jugular. Hmm? A good measure to go by is if Jesus was standing next to you, would you still say it? Because He is. He's living in you through the Spirit of God. The next Spirit, and I've spent way too much time, but I'm having a good time. Leave me alone. The next spirit that you'll find in churches is the spirit of ought. O-U-G-H-T. The Bible says in Matthew 5, 22, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of, of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. I'll never forget when I was about seven or eight, I called somebody a fool. My mother, she mashed me in the mouth. She said, you don't ever call anybody a fool. I didn't know why until she told me. Because the Bible says you call somebody a fool, you're in danger of hell fire. Huh? What you say matters. And the Bible's clear. But it goes on to say this in verse 23 of Matthew 5. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, he's talking about a lamb, he's talking about a, a sacrifice, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, that you're to go to your brother and make it right. In Mark eleven twenty five, 25, it says, And when you stand praying, forgive. If ye have ought against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. Well, what does ought mean? That's an old word. Well, it means that you hold something against somebody or somebody holds something against you or that it's something that binds. And can I say the spirit of ought will bind a church service? When you got two people in there that are at ought or at odds with one another, it will grieve the Holy Ghost of God and hurt the service can I say that this spirit is an unforgiving spirit I'm not apologizing I don't like that brother anyway I don't like that sister anyway it's an unforgiving spirit I'm reminded that we're commanded to forgive because God for Christ's sake hath forgiven us hmm? it's an unforgiving spirit just always mad at somebody. You know what unforgiveness leads to? Bitterness. Mm. 
It's not only an unforgiving spirit, it's an unsupportive spirit. Hmm? If I got an ought with Brother Jim, and Brother Jim feels led to stand up and testify, I'm not going to support him in his testimony. I'm going to sit there and say, what's he testifying for? He has no right to testify. He's a sorry, no good. I'm not supportive. I'm not saying, amen. I'm saying, what a, what a blessing. I'm not getting behind him when he's testifying. Huh? If I've got an ought against Brother Ray, and Brother Ray's up leading the singing, I'm thinking, why is he leading the singing? He don't need to lead the singing. Huh? He can't even ride the lawnmower without hitting his head under a limb. What's he up there doing? Huh? I'm not supportive. I'm holding something against him. Hmm? Not only an unforgiving and unsupportive spirit, it's an unyielding spirit. The preacher can preach on it all day long. He can get right with God. I'm right. They're wrong. I remind you the essence of sin is my right to my claim to myself. This may help you adjust your halo a little bit. There's times when we're all wrong. Hmm? There's times when we all got some misinformation. Hmm? There's times when something's going on and we really don't know what's going on and we make a judgment based on what we think is going on and that wasn't what was going on at all. And all the while, somebody comes to church and need help and they didn't get help because we had an unyielding, unsupported, unforgiving spirit. We're bitter and nasty and it's affecting the whole church. It's the spirit of ought. And it affects a lot of churches, especially hard shell Baptist churches, uh, where everybody thinks that they're right with God. Hmm? God help us. Hmm. We're real quick to look down our long nose at somebody else. God help us. Uh, and then the last spirit is the spirit of oneness. This is what the church should have. Paul wrote to, first in, to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 1.10, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. He wrote to Philippians, uh, uh, to the church of Philippi in Philippians 2 2. Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like minded, having the same love, being of one cord and of one mind. To every church that he wrote an epistle to, every one of them he tells them to be of the same mind, to be in one accord, to be like minded. The spirit of oneness is so important and invaluable to a church. Huh? Why? Because if you don't have it, you have division. Hmm? And that's what the devil does. Jesus says, the thief coming up, but for to steal, kill, and destroy. How does he do it? Through division, divide and conquer. It's the greatest method of war there's ever been. If we separate people from their supply line, we've got them. Well, our supply line's the Spirit of God. And if the devil can distract us and then divide us, he's one. Hmm? Every church has aisles. And everybody sits in this row and says, Oh, we're the best ones. We're the sheep. You're the goats. Who do you think really come up with that? Oh, well, the devil. You ought to be thankful you got a seat. You ought to be thankful they have padded seats. I grew up where the preacher preached as long as I preached. He was hurting. Huh? Well, he's just down there, at Brother Rocky, sitting in them metal chairs, and I was hurting. Huh? Even when we went inside to whatever pew I was sitting in, it didn't have much padding, huh? It had been well used, huh? I was hurt by the time we got home and drove all the way home. I was really hurt, and I couldn't wait to just lay down, huh? What can I say? We're not thankful we have a seat. We have a sense of entitlement. We believe the philosophy of this world, henceforth the philosophy of the devil. That I'm somebody, I have rights, and I need to do it my way. Says who? The Bible says if you're born again, you've been bought with a price, 
and your life is no longer your own. When Jesus Christ saved you, he did more than forgive you of your sins. Uh, he paid your sin debt. Uh, you once were a slave to sin, now you're a slave to him. Well, we don't like that kind of terminology. Hmm. The spirit of oneness is a spirit that is exhorting. It will tell us the truth and we will all be encouraged by it. We will all be thankful for it. Thank the Lord for truth. You know how hard it is to find truth anymore? I had an older man of God called me today and we talked for a while and he, called, and he asked me this question. He says, Doug, uh, you get around a whole lot more than I do. He said, are you finding young men preaching the truth? I said, sadly, not many. He said, in my day you could name any number of Bible colleges that had good men at the helm. Uh, and when a young man went to the Bible college and he came out uh, with a degree, he had something, he had knowledge of the Bible. I said, not happening today. I said, very few preachers today can preach expository messages and preach from the Word of God and deliver it in such a way that people understand what God was saying. Most young preachers just look for a jumping off point because they're looking for something that uh, 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 they can sound smarter than anybody that's come before them. And they want to play on people's emotions and get people's emotions involved. And they want to be humorous because if they're funny, people will like them. Uh, but they don't deliver the truth. Brother Sidney Weaver and I go to some meetings. We're not well liked. Not because we're both mean and nasty. We're not well liked because we're known as Bible preachers. I thought that's what all preachers were supposed to be. But when you have an envying spirit and not an exhorting spirit, you won't like Bible preaching. Can I say, the spirit of oneness is exhorting. It's edifying. It builds you up. Isn't it wonderful to come to church and feel good about being at church, getting some help, getting some encouragement? I don't know about you, but out there in the world, you only find discouragement. Uh, but isn't it good to come in and see a smiling face and hug somebody's neck and shake somebody's hand and spend some time fellowshipping uh, and feel better about your life? Uh, that's caused by the spirit of oneness. Can I say where there is no unity, there is no unction. There is no power from God. How do we have that being like-minded? Now let me let you in on something. That don't mean believing everything the same. Listen, Brother Donald, well, you've been saved, what, about three four years? There's no way in the world that you should know as much about the Bible as somebody has been saved 30 years. Probably you know more than a lot of people I know that has been saved 30 years. It doesn't mean believing everything exactly the same because not everybody's on the same spiritual maturity level. But it does mean having the same goals. We come tonight to worship Jesus. We come to believe the same core values about the Bible, the Bible distinctives that make us Baptists. Uh, we believe in the virgin birth. Uh, we believe in the sinless lamb. Uh, we believe in the precious blood of Jesus uh, uh, that saves us from our sin. Uh, uh, we believe uh, in true scriptural baptism. We believe in all the Baptist distinctives and Bible distinctives. By the way, the Bible is what makes me a Baptist. We believe in the, in the core same Bibles. We believe the King James Bible is the Word of God for English-speaking people. We believe it's without error. We believe all those things. But there are some people who want to get hung up on the gap theory. That's not the space between somebody's teeth. And there's other people who want to get caught up in all kinds of other non-essential things that we're not going to know about till we get to heaven. Some people believe that dinosaurs came over on the boat with, uh, with Noah. Some believe they don't. It, none of that matters. You can't have the spirit of oneness 
worried about junk like that. You have the spirit of one that's having the same goals. We come to worship Jesus. We come that God's people get help. And we come to see sinners saved. When you have the same goals, they'll be edifying. I don't know about you. There have been times I've went to some churches and went out filmed worse than when I went in. That should never be the case. There have been some churches I went to and I went out and felt dirty. Huh? It's good to be, be home where you come in. You know you're going to have some smile. You would not believe how many preachers that have come through this place. And number one, they felt like they were made to feel welcome. You guys, Miss Nett, there have been times we go to churches and people, nobody will come up and shake our hand. Not even the preacher's wife. And they come in, they say, boy, everybody, welcome me. And then preachers talk about the liberty that they have preaching. Now, they don't get that everywhere because not everybody comes for the right reason. I got tickled, Brother Dean McNeese, on Friday night of revival. He was enjoying the liberty so much, I think he forgot that he was supposed to be preaching. <laughs> He's just having a time, and then all of a sudden, it just kind of dawned on him. Hey, you know what? I'm supposed to preach tonight. Uh, you know? You know why? He doesn't get that everywhere. Hmm? And I say the spirit of oneness is a spirit that's exhorting, it's edifying. It's an endearing spirit. It's a loving spirit. Aren't you glad we got a church where popes love one another? Huh? I'd hate to go to church and say, oh, I hate that person's guts. But there's churches like that. It's an embracing spirit. Isn't it a blessing? To be a part of a church that embraces people no matter where they came from. I heard this story about an old preacher. This is how old this story was. They still, when he got off the train, he had to travel 50 miles by, by a, a, a wagon and mules. The guy picked him up. He made his way through the Appalachians down in eastern Kentucky, and he came over a ridge, and and the guy that was driving the team of mules just stopped, and they looked down on the little town he was supposed to go to and do some business. Uh, and uh, 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 the, the, the guy right, you know, heading up the team of mules looked, and he said, told the preacher, he said, look down there, right in the center of town is the church. He said, that's the most beautiful sight there. Well, the, the preacher, he, he said, it was a beautiful church. So when they got down to town, he said, just let me off here. And he went and he knocked on the door of the parsonage next to the church and the preacher came out, the pastor of the church. He said, sir, could I go look at the church? And the preacher smiled. He got his hat, put his hat on, went out. And the preacher started to uh, 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 comment and he said, every stone in this church we got off of what used to be the road. He said, the things that used to cause our wagons to hit bumps and hit hard spots and caused us to bounce around ended up making the most beautiful church isn't it amazing that some of the lives that used to be some of the bumpiest and some of the worst they get saved by the good, good, good grace of God and they turn out to be some of the most beautiful sights you'll ever see huh? isn't it wonderful to be a part of a church that it don't matter where you come from don't matter what you're guilty of. Uh, we want to get you to Jesus. Uh, and it is an amazing to see folks around here uh, when they first showed up. They don't look like they looked like tonight. Uh, but to see what God did in their life and to see the Spirit of God work on their life uh, and to look at them tonight after God's been polishing on them and working on them, uh, what used to be uh, hideous and bumpy and ugly uh, is now something to behold. And it takes the Spirit of God to do that. Uh, can I say the spirit of oneness is also enriching? I don't know about you, but my life is better because of this church. Amen. My life's been enriched because of people in this church. My life's been enriched because of what this church stands for. The spirit of oneness is what we need to strive for. Those other spirits hurt the spirit of oneness. So I challenge you. To pray before you come to church. Come to church in the right spirit. 
Ask the Lord why you're here to help you keep the right spirit. Kind of put blinders on. That's what they put on horses so horses don't look around. Quit looking around and start looking up. Huh? And come in the right spirit and seek the, the right spirit. And by all means, if you don't have a right spirit, uh, hit the altar and ask God to help you with your wrong spirit so you can have the right spirit. Uh, and certainly if you got an alt with somebody, get that thing settled. Uh, uh, get that straightened out. Uh, and if you got an unforgiving spirit, get to the Lord uh, and ask Him and beg Him uh, uh, to forgive you and help you to get over that thing. Uh, and hey, let's all get the right spirit because all those other spirits will hinder this church and hinder every life in this church. I've often said I appreciate our young people. And I've often said if time goes on, what kind of church are they going to have? Hmm? What kind of church is little Elizabeth and little Ella going to have if the Lord doesn't come back? What kind of preacher are they going to have? What kind of deacons are they going to have? What kind of song leaders are they going to have? What kind of specials are they going to hear? Huh? What kind of teachers are they going to have? What kind of church? That's all determined on what kind of church we are today. Hmm? All these young people are, are precious. And one thing that causes me to be who I am is I want to stay straight because I don't want to disappoint them. I've had four pastors in my life. Two of them went bad. I don't want these young people to say, well, I had a pastor named Brother Doug, but he went bad. Hmm? Huh? I want to finish right. And when it comes time to hand this thing off, if the Lord don't come back, I want to hand it off with no regrets. How about you? What's your life doing? You see, in the work of faith, we're all fitly framed together. There's no big eyes and, and, and little U's here. We're all the same. What's good for the pastor ought to also be good for you. What kind of spiritual and Christian legacy are you leaving? Because hmm? it's important. And let me help you, moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas. What Brother Doug preaches isn't worth a flip if you're not living it at home. Hmm? If you two's house is a war zone, me preaching all these youngins you bring with you ain't going to help them at all. Hmm? If they don't see Christ in you at home and see a testimony that the Bible expounds, in, it don't matter what their Sunday school teachers teach them. Hmm? And let me help you something. Children are not stupid. They can usually pick out a fake long before an adult can. Hmm? What are they seeing in you, Mom and Dad? What are they hearing out of you? Huh? I've seen... I don't know why I'm on this. I'm done with my outline. I've seen... Years gone by where... When Sunday service is over and they go out to eat or eat at the home... Around the dinner table, all they do is tear down the preacher and everything he preached on. All week long, all they do is tear around godly people. Never once considering little Johnny and little Susan or listening to everything they say. And when little Johnny turns out about 15, 16, he's one of the biggest heathens in town, then they want to go get the preacher and have him fix it. Too late. You done ruined him. And he has no confidence in the preacher anyway because you've chewed him up for dinner every week for, for, for 10 years. So what I'm trying to say is the spirit of oneness doesn't happen when we get here. The spirit of oneness happens with what we bring with us. Huh? God help us to have the right spirit. It's something we've got to guard. It's something we've got to fight for. And there are a lot of things we've got to fight against. But can I say it's worth it when we start seeing the Spirit of God changing lives. There's nothing worse than coming to church and a bad spirit hurts the service. That might not affect you, but when I go home, I take that home with me. I don't sleep well. 
We ought to all be that way. God help us to protect the Spirit of God. I'm going to tell you this. I'll be done. Maybe. After a message like this, this is what's going to happen. Let me pick on Brett. This is what's going to happen. We're going to show up Sunday. The place is going to be packed. If you're not careful, that spirit of opinion, that opinion is, well, where were they Wednesday? They sure needed that message. Well, evidently, you didn't get it. And you were sitting here. Huh? The only person in this world that you can control is you. And here's the only way you can get past that opinionated spirit. If they belong to God, he knows how to take care of them. And if they don't belong to God, if i got a bad spirit, they won't come to God. So you just control you. Let the Lord take care of the rest of it. Huh? I have to fight that all the time. I fight all the time. How come they don't come back to church? Didn't I study enough? Didn't I pray enough? Didn't I have the right message? Did I do something wrong? Lord, did I preach something wrong? And I fight that constantly. And I'll really fight it here in a couple weeks because when I go to Grenada, there'll be a tent full of people that if I preach four hours, they'll be excited in the fourth hour as they were in the first ten minutes. And when Friday night's over, they'll weep and wish that I never left. And then I'll show up here on Sunday, and there'll be people that don't come back Sunday night. And part of me thinks... I should have just stayed in Grenada. Say, so how do you know? Because every time I go to St. Lucia, it's that way. Huh? Why? Because those people want it. You know why they want it? Because they don't have televisions. And they don't have video game systems. And they don't have internet. And they don't have good cushy jobs. And they don't have cars. All they've got is their family and the Lord. And you know when the church was great? When all people had was their family and the Lord. God help us to get the right spirit so we can see God change people's lives. And that starts not looking around, but looking within. God help us to be all that we can be in Him. I'm done. Brother Clint Gum gets a song of invitation. So he's picking out a song. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for helping us tonight, Lord. Good liberty in the house of God tonight. I appreciate that. God, help us to have that sweet spirit, that spirit of oneness. Help us to esteem others better than ourselves. Help us, Lord, to pray one for another and to show Christian love one to another. And Lord, help us to have a forgiving spirit and a yielding spirit. Help us, Lord, to have a spirit that desires to please you. Help us, Lord, to be a stepping stone for sinners to get saved. Help our church to be a lighthouse in this community. Help us, God, to see many come to Christ. God, send revival, true revival to our hearts. And God, I pray you'd bind the, all those odd spirits and other spirits. And God, I pray that, God, we'd see you do great things. Lord, if it's going to get done, you've got to do it. But, Lord, you'll only do it if we allow you to. So, God, help us to be obedient and help us to be all we can be in Christ. God, there may be somebody here tonight that's been hurt in church. I pray they'd get help. I pray the sweet Holy Ghost of God do something good for them. Maybe somebody here tonight that has been discouraged. I pray you'd encourage them. God, there may be somebody here tonight, Lord, just needs some help. I pray the sweet Holy Ghost go around them, just help them tonight. Lift them up. Lift up their head. Lift up their heart toward heaven. God, there may be somebody here tonight that's lost. I know I didn't preach to lost people. But I've seen the Holy Ghost do wonderful things even when a message wasn't geared to the lost. And God, I pray you'd convict them. We'd see them saved. God, do a work in folks' hearts and lives. And God, give our church the spirit of oneness every time we meet. And God, we'll bless you for it. For it's in the holy name of Jesus we ask it all. Amen. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.